an honor to follow Zainab. Uh, i really big fan of, of the work she's doing. And I saw Don Marty out there in the audience as well. He's another interesting person to talk to about this topic. Um, <clears throat> I want to return us to uh, a little bit more of an optimistic take of maybe where we've been and maybe where we can get to as well. Um, uh, Mozilla is almost uh, uh, 20 years old at this point. It's about 18 years ago, 1998, when the Mozilla project was spun out of uh, Netscape. Uh, in fact, the code name Mozilla was used uh, inside of Netscape even before that point. So you could argue it's over 20 years ago. Um, but what I wanted to do was uh, uh, do a reference check. Uh, uh, who here was actually online in 1996? Wow, OK. So, uh, I, so you, you, you all are probably on the same wavelength then. Um, uh, what I wanted to do, just because I thought it really captured the spirit of those of us who were there, uh, uh, or even earlier than that, uh, of really what the potential was of this thing that we were building. Um, oh, and, and as the person who put the first ad banner online, I'm really sorry. Uh, I, if I could have <laughs> rewind the clock, I would try to have done something. But if it wasn't me, it would have been somebody else the next week, I swear. Um, but let me just read this, because I think it's worth getting into the record and worth hearing out loud again. Um, so this is John Perry Barlow, who is a co-founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He uh, was a, uh, a poet, uh, a rancher in Wyoming. He has great stories about Dick Cheney. Um, uh, he also was a lyricist for the Grateful Dead, um, and uh, really a, a very active voice on The Well, which was an early uh, uh, community online. Um, and he issued something at uh, the World Economic Forum's gathering in Davos in 1996, uh, which was in front of an audience of a bunch of governments, a bunch of uh, large industrialists, uh, uh, and, and it was called the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. Cyberspace consists of transactions, relationships, and thought itself, arrayed like a standing wave in the web of communications. Ours is a world that is both everywhere and nowhere, and it is, but it is not where bodies live. We are creating a world that all may enter without privilege or prejudice, accorded by race, economic power, military force, or station of birth. We are creating a world where anyone, anywhere, may express his or her beliefs, no matter how singular, without fear of being coerced into silence or conformity. We will create a civilization of mind in cyberspace. There's a lot more to it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's pretty inspirational, but also pretty didactic. Uh, and, and I think for a lot of us, you know, hopelessly idealistic, right? Uh, but, but many of the best documents are, I would argue, the actual Declaration of Independence and Constitution uh, were impossibly idealistic at the end of the 18th century. Um, but the state of the internet in 96 uh, uh, wasn't too far from an architecture that actually made those messages sound inherently reasonable. Uh, at that point in time, uh, every workstation, more or less, you know, if you were connected to the internet, you know, and you were at least on the, on the right side of a, of a 2400 baud connection, um, uh, your workstation was likely also a mail server. It was likely also a file server for other, other computers. It was likely also a web server. In fact, I, this graphic here is of a computer that I had while I was at Wired. Yes, it's where the crime was committed. Um, but uh, I, it was uh, my desktop machine. Wired had gotten it in an ad trade with SGI. Uh, it was a really sweet computer, and it was also the, the fastest computer that the magazine had at the time. So when we launched Hotwired, actually when we launched our first website, and then Hotwired, the ad-supported site, that was our web server, was my desktop, sitting there on the machine. And in the middle of the day, it would slow down a little bit, but it, was a, it had a public IP address that was routable, right? And I shut down you know, the right set of ports and things like that, so it was secure, at least, at the time. Um, but that was just the state of things, right? And actually, we had a failover box. My, my colleagues, uh, SGI as well, uh, those are the two most powerful computers. But this seemed like an eminently reasonable thing to do, right? Yeah, you have firewalls and that sort of thing, but why not? These are powerful enough. Um, I think there is also this principle, especially hearkening to the dumb network principle, that all TCP packets going over the internet are created equal, right? Uh, modulo, a, whole, a couple of different things, but basically, if you can send a packet on the network, it has the same right to get to its destination as anyone else's packets, right? No matter where it was coming from, as it was being handed off. There wasn't, it was too cheap to meter, too cheap to charge to figure out, is this packet going around the world or is it going next door? In both cases, why don't we just get it from, from point A to point B. Um, and then most importantly, all of the protocols that the internet was built upon, they were built, they were open protocols. I mean, the way that you got a new internet protocol was getting it through the internet engineering task force or building an open source implementation and sharing it with people. We didn't even call it open source till about 1998. But um, 
uh, they were all collaboratively built. And that was just kind of how you did things. Um, so if you were to ask us today, well, what does the internet look like uh, as a result of a lot of this, right? You could say, well, it's, it's a series of tubes, right? Uh, uh, pipes that connect uh, uh, the nations of the world and inside of those nations as well. Uh, it's actually really, really uh, thick, to, thick these days. Um, this picture might actually look a, a bit better in terms of what it looks like as a network right now uh, in, in, in terms of at the, at the TCP IP layer, uh, uh, packets flying around and, and that sort of thing. But the problem was um, uh, the next layers up from the raw networking layers have, we've kind of gone backwards. Um, so this is perhaps arguably a better picture of what the internet looks like today. This is a data center, uh, it, it's an, it happens to be in Iowa, it could be in uh, Oregon, it could be in India, it could be in China. Uh, this is a Google data center, by the way. Um, and uh, one thing you notice, and it's you know, not, not just an artifact of how the photo was taken, there isn't anybody there. Right? Uh, uh, in fact, communities that warmly welcomed many of these companies in to set up data centers in their midst uh, often found that they weren't quite the jobs engine that they thought that they were, because it doesn't take that many people to rack a bunch of new machines and keep the, keep the lights on. Um, we've allowed this kind of centralization, and perhaps this is a bit metaphorical, uh, uh, not nearly as metaphorical as this, perhaps. Um, I, I, that centralization uh, of, of our services, you know, everyone using Gmail, everyone using Twitter, everyone using Facebook, uh, and concentrating that on, on small clusters of machines has actually made it easy to allow ourselves to fall into the surveillance trap. Um, this is a, a photo of when uh, uh, the EFF and a couple of other organizations, I'm sure somebody can shout them out, um, partnered together, sorry? Greenpeace, right, exactly. Partner together to send a balloon up uh, over the NSA's uh, data center in Utah. Uh, this is the, the large data center that they're collecting all the data from, right? Um, uh, and uh, uh, we've allowed ourselves, I think, to slip into this state where because of the concentration of services, it's become easier to surveil. Um, and if you want uh, to think of it as like a series of, of progressions, right, uh, it, it, on the left-hand side is kind of the most, the easiest way to build a network or build a service as a, as a kind of a hub and spoke kind of architecture. Arguably, that's what a BBS was or what AOL or CompuServe was. And when we got to the internet, we were able to start to connect these networks together uh, and, and be much more kind of rich and, and, and use open protocols and that sort of thing. And that's, that's the middle graph. And we were fairly well on our way to actually getting to a nice distributed architecture, uh, something that, that you know, could actually be resilient against attacks, resilient against uh, uh, single companies coming in or, or choke points. Uh, but we kind of, you know, even if we solved that problem at the, the raw networking layer, we reintroduced that problem. I think we went backwards in time uh, at the layers above. And I'll argue that this is partly the original sin of the web, was that we designed it as a client server thing. We designed the clients to be dumb <laughs> and the server servers to be really smart. Uh, and it was kind of easier to scale a big service like, like Gmail uh, or, or Twitter than it was to think about how do we actually push some intelligence to the edge and keep these things decentralized as we went further up the stack. Um, now, there's a whole bunch of problems that arise from this, right? Uh, uh, the first problem is one of resiliency. Um, last week, there was a major denial of service attack, distributed denial of service attack, against a DNS provider called Dyn. And it had the ramifications of bringing down uh, uh, parts of Twitter for parts of the world, Spotify, uh, Reddit, I think, was attacked. Um, and this is not a once in a, in, a, in, a, in a while fluke. This is something where it looks like this, may, this kind of uh, activity may become more and more common, uh, especially if we don't figure out how to secure the endpoints and stop putting uh, IP cameras out on the net that can swamp uh, our, these servers. But the inherent centralization that has gone on has introduced this level of unreliability, I'd argue, into, into the internet that, that we're building. And it, I don't see us coming out of the, uh, as long as we stay on the, uh, on the same course. Um, it's also led to a lot of the stuff that Zainab pointed at, uh, which I think it, it even goes deeper. Uh, I, you know, different services have different terms of use that end up being uh, I, not just not not just harmful in some circumstances, but uh, I, I, you know, actually things that might violate our conceptions of uh, uh, human rights and what the right thing to do is. So, for example, on on uh, Facebook, they have a real names policy, um, and uh, I know actually a number of people whose real names 
names Facebook did not believe was their real name, <laughs> uh, which meant that they had to show ID and prove who they are, and it was kind of crazy. But beyond that, there are a lot of people out there for whom revealing their real name online is an invitation to abuse, is an invitation to stalkers, uh, ex-spouses, uh, 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 to uh, 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 you know situations where it increases the danger of them being online. Uh, and, and an entire movement has sprung up to try to counter uh, Facebook's policy in this, in this space. Uh, but, but we see echoes of this elsewhere. With YouTube, for example, they change the terms of service with their creators on a, on a fairly regular basis, and rarely is it in favor of the creators on those services. Um, and then finally, when we have platforms that end up being owned by one entity or by a small number of entities, then often the benefits to that platform accrue either mostly to the platform provider or to a small number of providers on top of that platform. So most of the, you probably know, in the Apple App Store, um, the vast, vast majority of uh, builders of apps, of authors of apps, uh, see very little revenue from, from that. Really, the top 1% of developers uh, command the majority of the revenue uh, and uh, I, uh, only, uh, sorry, um, about 94% uh, of the revenue goes to the top 1%, um, which is, I mean, even if you assume that a lot of society is kind of a, a curve, uh, is just is just outrageous. It's not a great place to build a, a, a thriving long-term business on, unless you're able to give the app away for free, right, uh, and uh, and then and then monetize it some other way. Um, and this gets, has gotten us away from an internet where flat, permissionless innovation uh, ends up being a generator of, of a lot of good for us. Um, uh, the neutral and level playing field provided by permissionless innovation has empowered all of us with the freedom to express ourselves and innovate online without having to seek the permission of a remote telecom executive. And I might add to that, you know, uh, a, remote, a remote government, right? Uh, a, uh, a remote pol a politician, a remote, uh, I, I, you know, other type of industry executive. Right? We need to get, figure out how to get back to an internet that is sufficiently decentralized. So who's going to fix this? Um, last June, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, Brewster Kale and the Internet Archive hosted uh, a decentralized web summit. Uh, and this was a gathering of a bunch of the technologists in this space, uh, people who had been, been there for quite a while. Uh, on the bottom left, you see Brewster on the left and Vince Cerf and Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, you see our own Mitchell Baker there attending as well, talking about Mozilla's efforts in this space. People like Cory Doctorow, who've done a lot to kind of raise the profile of the importance of the decentralized web. Uh, and as well as Primavera de Filippi, who has studied uh, a lot about the, both the technology and the social ramifications of building the decentralized web. But the vast majority of people in that picture up above are builders, are technologists. And they're building a really interesting set of technologies, many of them competing, but overall uh, building what is really, I think, the next generation platform for the internet. So a couple of the projects that I just want to quickly highlight and, and hope that you spend more time learning about, because uh, there are far too many to get into in any d depth here. Uh, the first I'd point out is something called uh, IPFS. And IPFS stands for Interplanetary File System. Uh, it's uh, uh, one of its lead developers, Juan Bennett, has described it as, you know, we're going to Mars and we need to figure out how do we have an internet that works when some people are on Mars and some people are here, right? Uh, and, and their focus initially is how do we um, uh, have a di file distribution network that works even if uh, you know, you've got networks that are disconnected or have really long time, right? So instead of thinking on the left here about a central server dishing out files and content, think about being able to find that content wherever it might sit on a network and being able to address it, and this is for the geeks, as a hash of the content of the file, so you know exactly that you're getting the right file, uh, and using a distributed hash tree to, to work your way around the net to find the, local, the, the closest copy. And once you find it, pull it closer uh, uh, and then make it cacheable so the next one can find it. So you know all that money that goes into companies like Akamai and, and you know, Cloudflare and everyone else to like, build these super distributed networks? Well, with technologies like IPFS, we have a, a fighting chance of being able to cut the cost of doing that and provide that as a, as a, as a true cloud, right? Not as a, what we know of today as the cloud, which is using other people's computers, right? But actually decentralizing uh, where the content lives on the net. Um, the next project I really uh, encourage people to check out is Ethereum. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Uh, it's not Bitcoin 2.0. Uh, it is a cryptocurrency-driven project, but uh, what they're really trying to build is the global computer, 
right? Uh, the, uh, a system for being able to deploy applications across a grid, across a blockchain, and I'll go into that in a little bit, uh, uh, where uh, uh, those, those programs can run autonomously, where they can implement decentralized versions of everything from Airbnb or Uber, or most infamously recently, uh, an attempt to do a decentralized uh, venture capital fund, and I'll get into that in a bit. Um, the project that I'm most directly involved in is something called Hyperledger. Uh, it's a collaborative project at the Linux Foundation. Uh, we're working with a whole bunch of banks and IT companies and, and, and uh, 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 kind of old school kind of companies, but uh, trying to get them to uh, and, and work with them to build a common technology platform for blockchain technology. And in the time we have here, there's no time to really go into what uh, a blockchain is, but um, think of it as a common database and a common uh, transaction layer that instead of going through a central server like that star configuration you saw before, um, allows us to decentralize a transaction record, a ledger, a distributed ledger, and then push uh, scripts that run on that network and uh, work in a very cooperative way. So kind of like Ethereum, um, also working inside of companies and between companies. But between all these different services, we could start to build things, uh, uh, applications in a way that, that push the boundaries of, of how we'd understand it today. Rather than talking about, you know, a, 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 you know, this is actually what might be a very boring example, but uh, you could take the way that car leases work online. And rather than implementing it as like one big, you know, automobile uh, website, right, uh, like, uh, with, that everyone feeds into and pulls out of, uh, instead decentralize it with the different participants in that network, everybody from the manufacturer to the dealer to a scrap merchant running their own nodes on a decentralized network and exchanging data and conducting business and transactions but without any of them having to be the center of that universe, none of them having to be the eBay or the Amazon or the Gmail of that industry. Um, there are people trying to do this for medical records too, uh, trying to say, can we take uh, 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 information that, that about you know, people's immunizations, for example, or the, the prescriptions that they, that they take, or uh, 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 records about them or records about population health, and store that in a way that preserves privacy, that is encrypted in the right way, but actually makes that data more portable between organizations and ideally puts the patient back at the center of health information exchange. Um, and, and when you do that, the idea of reinventing how these systems talk to end users is, is hopefully that's one of the big outcomes, right? Uh, so instead of thinking about you know, going to an insurance website or going to a hospital website and, and logging in and checking your record there, think about bringing that data closer, right? If it's, if it's in the medical space, what about a, like a health wallet? something that brings those records in, that, that is something that you keep no matter what providers you change, what job you change, and thus insurance. I, I, everyone in the UK and Canada, they have the perfect system, we understand, but in the US, it's very complicated. But being able to take your data with you and show it to the next person, that's something that's novel. That's something that we don't have in the healthcare space uh, and has never been fully implemented. And there's a chance that a blockchain gets us there. And this is how it'll end up looking to end users. So how do we get there from here? Um, I've got message to the geeks, which I don't think many of you here are. Um, uh, pursue decentralization, right? Um, look at these technologies, spend time understanding their architectures. They're all pre-1.0. It is very much 1994 in the web. Or uh, uh, Joey Ito likes to say it's 1989 in the web, you know, um, uh, two years before Tim Berners-Lee published his paper. Um, uh, uh, we're still pre-TLS, if you want to think of it that way, right? Uh, it's still early days, um, but a lot of the hard work is being done right now under a lot of interesting services. And do think about um, if you can't design a service that is all the way decentralized, pursuing what I've called minimum viable centralization. The DNS system, the domain name system out there is something I'd say is minimally centrally uh, uh, managed. Uh, there's, there's, you know, we can go into that and, and the Dyn uh, uh, hack recently was, was perhaps a counter example, but uh, it's certainly a case where there isn't one big DNS server in the cloud that we all talk to. It's fairly decentralized. Um, I'd also encourage the geeks, let's talk more about end device security and how do we make that a priority. Let's talk about governance too. I, I, uh, this is essential when we're talking about blockchain-based apps and distributed apps. Who is it that kind of can update those apps? Who is it that has to agree before an action can be taken? Um, and what is the role for nonprofits in this space to actually make it work? Um, and there's some hard architectural choices we'll have to make too. Um, and then finally, a message to everyone, learn more about these technologies as end users. Uh, and when, when people want to sit you down and talk about it, uh, hear them out. Um, uh, that's it.
Any questions? Let's take, let's take one question over here. It's a plea as much as a question. Um, uh, with all these decentralized technologies, um, and particularly the blockchain, current blockchain technologies, they just are based on translating oil into virtual currency. And can we have something that's a bit green? Right. So, in, so I'll repeat the question a little bit, um, but reframe, reframe it a bit. So in 2009, when uh, Satoshi first published the, the, his paper, which kind of laid the groundwork for Bitcoin, um, I ignored it. And I'm sure many of you did as well, because it seemed like the most ungreen thing in the world to run these, this, uh, all this CPU power just to run a, a lottery to figure out who gets to put the next link in a chain. So Bitcoin is famous for consuming a lot of CPU power, perhaps needlessly so. All right, um, Ethereum, and that's uh, that's partly because it's based on something called proof of work as the core mechanism for building this global ledger. Um, a lot more detail in it I can't go into right now, but. Proof of work uh, uh, is, is the only way we know today how to run a large public consensus mechanism uh, 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 that, that you could argue is fair, that is really, really hard to game. Um, the Ethereum community uses proof of work, but is trying to move beyond that to something called proof of stake, right? Uh, there's some really good research going on there. Um, this is still really at the cutting edge, though, and they're making a tremendous gamble as they move from one to the next. I'm very optimistic we'll find alternative uh, consensus mechanisms that will allow us to retire proof of work. Um, uh, uh, but that's, that's something that still requires a lot of really hard crypto work at this point in time. So, uh, uh, and there's a lot of applications for blockchains that uh, don't require proof of work, don't require a public anonymous system either. Uh, and I think that's where we're going to see a lot of deployment of blockchain tech. If you just have 20 banks or you've got a government and real estate agents and title insurance companies who all just need a distributed ledger, you can use a quorum-based consensus mechanism rather than a proof-of-work based one uh, to, to, to accomplish that. So if we focus less on Bitcoin and much more on blockchain, I think we'll make a lot more progress. So for Brian. Thank you very much, Brian. Sure.